Okay, let's welcome Maria Jose. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy of being here. Thank you very much for the invitation to have this talk. So I didn't do that. No, leave it like that. Well, as, as, uh, as he said, I'm a faculty member of a Chilean university in Valparaiso. I'm also a PI of a research center, I will tell you later. The, the university is this one, is the Universidad Tecnica Federico Santa Maria. I'm part of the electronic department of this university. Um, we are facing the sea, we have an incredible, this is an incredible place, it's a very beautiful place, so we are all invited you. You are all invited you to come to visit us. I'm also part of this center. This is a research center called Advanced, Advanced Center in Electrical and Electronic Engineer, AC3E. And inside this center, there are many research lines. Um, I'm currently heading the research line dedicated to data analytics and artificial intelligence. So as a Chilean, I cannot avoid to talk a little bit about this, okay? We as a country, we are facing a big transformation. We're moving towards a more just and equal society. I want to declare my commitment, my commitment with the human rights and condemn any kind of violence against any people or person on earth. Maybe you have seen a lot of violence on television, but I just want to show you that this is not only violence, this is thousands of people moving, walking across between Viña del Mar and Valparaiso, trying to believe in this better country. Within this context, I think that education and science are fundamental for this transformation. So, So let's talk about science, right? <laughs> As I, my presentation said, I work in neuroscience and artificial intelligence. So I'm trying to bring knowledge from neuroscience and apply this to artificial intelligence. I mainly work in vision. Uh, you did a question about how can we learn from human vision system or mammalian vision system. I use this information for artificial intelligence. I'm going just to show you a little bit, a little bit about vision and on Friday I have a second talk in the parallel session I will tell you more about that in this session so from vision what do we know about human vision we know that every time an image comes into our, our eyes it is projected over a thin layer of cells at the bottom which we call the retina and the retina is in charge of convert this light information into electrical information that then travel through the optic nerve up to the, the visual cortex right but if we look closer at the retina, we see that it's formed by very different cells. And the light is actually crossing all the retina up to the photoreceptors, photoreceptors do the transduction from light to electricity. And then there are many other cell layers involved in several computations up to the retinal ganglion cells, which are here at the bottom in green. And these retinal ganglion cells are in charge to convert and to gather all this electrical activity into the spike trains that finally travel through the optic nerve. And it's not only this type of cells, we can see that for each layer of these cells, we have so many different cell types. So if we combine all the circuitries, we can see that it's hard to believe that the retina is only trans doing the transaction between light and electricity. Actually, the retina is doing very complex computation of the visual scene. And this is the, an example of the different cell types that you can find for photoreceptors, horizontals, bipolar, amacrinan, and retinal ganglion cells. And if we can have, as engineers, we can look at the system as a connection system. And this is all the cell types inside the retina, and we can see that they're connecting each other in very different manners. The black and white dots are excitatory and inhibitory synapses, chemical synaptics while the things that look like a resistance, do you think here, are electrical synapses. So we do research on retina physiology, and we have proposed model for direction selectivity in the retina. We have also put the role of electrical synapses and the retinal ganglion cells of the adrenal rodent. We have 
characterize retinal ganglion cells at different eccentricities of the retina. And we also have found a speed selectivity in the retina when it is faced to naturalistic stimuli, okay? So the retina research is mainly done in collaboration with the, with the Neuroscience Center in Valparaiso, which is mainly Adrian Palacios, which is here. This is Cesar Reyer, who is helping us to do all this job. So as I told you, we were characterizing the retinal receptive fields, what the cells at the retina are linear observing from the visual scene. This is the spatial pattern, and this is the temporal pattern. You talk about that your visual, your visual features were split in space and time. And in the retina, we can find that the space and time computation are mainly separated, and visual cortex is mixed, but here it's separated. And we learn from here that cells at the center are smaller and slower compared with cells at the periphery. So if we pick up one of each cell, and we can do a convolution, we can consider these cells as linear filters, and we convolve an image, we observe things like that. So they're seeing different things of the visual scene. They are excellent feature structures of the information contained in the visual scene. Um, within the circuit of the retina, there is also, the retina is an excellent, con it has an excellent contrast equalizer. So there is a circuit which is computer nonlinear contrast gain control. And what we did is to pick up a model of nonlinear control, uh, contrast gain control, and we apply that model to equalize the contrast on image. It's what we know in computer vision as tone mapping. And we propose a tone mapping operator based on the retina uh, computation that works pretty much well, and how the retina, no, it's not only computing space features, but it's only computing space-time features. This tone map operator can also work on videos, okay? I will show you more about that on, on Friday. Uh, this is another example. We can use the retina. We can think that retina is, comp is taking some certain features. We can do some image compression, and we can convert the, the video on the right to a retina. Oh, sorry, I put it again. There it is. The video on the right, we can pass it through a, a a model of retina getting the retina activity, and from the retina activity, reproduce what is going on the, on the left. And we can see that we only consider 5% of the information. We're able to see pretty well what's going on in the visual scene. And this image compression works better than your YouTube, for instance, when you lose connectivity. Okay. Um, <clears throat> more related to robots and more related to artificial intelligence with the people which is here, Hans, Rodrigo, and Mauricio. We got inspired from a deep reinforcement model to guide, to do auto autonomous navigation in complex scenario. This is the deep mind simulator. So this is the known architecture in the state of the art, which considers visual features from the input scene. And from these visual features, this is a deep reinforcement learning it computes a policy as a value, so the goal here is to collect as much reward as possible, and we can consider that the agent has learned something when the, it maximizes the collected award. So what we did here is was to replace the fir this first convolutional ne neural network by a module based on retina. Okay, a module based on what we know about retina. So we consider two simple cells, only linear computation from a cell coming from the center and a cell coming from the periphery, and we replaced this model like that. We did the same exercise, and we checked how much the reward is gathered, is collected by the artificial agent. agent. And what we observe here is that the blue traces, yeah, that in some cases, the retina it's not able to collect as much reward as the others. But there are other cases, like this for a static or for a random maze, that the retina module uh, uh, speed up the learning of the system. So you are able to collect much more reward faster than if you have to learn the visual features of the input system. Okay. That was about vision. So what do we know about decision making? Decision-making in humans is mainly based 
involved with this subcortical structure, which is called the basal ganglia. Okay. And the basal ganglia know by itself, the basal ganglia is connected with other cortical areas. The basal ganglia is connected with the prefrontal cortex and with the thalamus. And this circuitry that is mainly based by the neurotransmitter, which may, probably you know that is called the dopamine, is in charge of gather, control the decisions we take about everything that happens with us. So, how it's driven by dopamine, maybe you know what happens when dopamine fails. There are some neural disorders related when you have too much dopamine and when you don't have enough dopamine, which are schizophrenia or Parkinson's disease. So it's very important to know how our decisions could be varying because you have a problem with your dopamine resources because it will tell you in advance which kind of neural pathology maybe you could have. In a, it could serve as a biomarker for neural diseases. So what we did here is we took a model of these different interactions and this work like that, we have a motor decision on the left, on the right, and a cognitive decision on the left, more an associative path here in the middle, and this works at Wagner takes all. The first loop who's able to take a decision is the one decision we do. So in this model, we include all the dopamine receptors. At this moment, we only include um, phasic dopamine, and we can say that D1 dopamine receptor modulate the behavior it said when the, the, the hypothesis is that you can switch between exploration or exploitation, changing the level of dopamine. And the hypothesis is that low level of dopamine you explore, okay? And high levels of dopamine you exploit what you have learned. But we also know from dopamine that dopamine can influence your learning. So it's not only influencing your behavior, it's also influence the way you learn. So to test this hypothesis, we put this model as a robot controller who has to perform the following task. The, they, the robot has to live longer. How it lives? Because in the green dots, it converts potential energy into vital energy. Vital energy is essential for living. How do I get potential energy? So I have to walk over the green dots. So the robot has to learn that it has to First, be over the green dots, and then to the red dots, and then green dots, and red dots again and again, in order to live longer. And we evaluated how much it lives, depending on the level of dopamine. And this is the histograms we had, we had here. And we can see that the lifetime histograms, that the lifetime increases as the dopamine increases, okay? And if we look at the positions where the rubber was placed, at the low dopamine, we see that the robot goes everywhere, so it is exploring a lot, okay? While when the dopamine increases, the robot, it, it learns a trajectory. It is the fact the robot, what it's doing here, it's exploding what it has learned, okay? What about social interactions, okay? This is a girl looking outside, outside it's raining, he wants to go to play outside, but she knows that if he goes outside for playing, maybe her, ma her mom will get upset, and maybe he, she's going to have a cold. But she goes anyway, okay? And what happened afterwards? She gets a cold, okay? So the thing is that, I guess, and she knew that, and even if she knew that, she did it anyway. So the thing is that even if you know something, it doesn't mean that you're, it doesn't guarantee you will follow that information to take the decision. So it's when in psychology we say that we are dealing with different decision making at the same time and they're competing each other. So in which cases you take one or another. In psychology, this is proposed as a dual process model of the human mind where you have an impulsive system and a reflective system. The impulsive system, system is what you do by instinct, is what the, the things you do without thinking that much, and the reflective system is where you think a lot about that. The better example about this is when you learn how to drive a car. At the beginning, you have to think about every single movement you do. You cannot talk while you're driving, you cannot call by phone, you cannot do WhatsApp while you're driving, you can do, don't do anything, only drive. But as soon as you become an expert driver, you don't think anymore about that. Okay, so that process that at the beginning was based on the reflective system, it becomes driven by the impulsive system, okay? 
And when it's impulsive, it's an habit, you can do many other things while you're driving. So, okay, the innovative thing, the dual process is not something new. What is something new about that is that they propose something called motivational orientation at the impulsive level. So it says that your impulsive action is controlled by something that is called motivational orientation that could be approach or avoidance. This is the thing that happens when you're in a stadium and some things, for example, start a fight. You don't think that much, but you do it anyway. So the objects around us are all perceived with a given orientation, and the things that we perceive the orientation of others. If we are all happy, it's more likely we be, can be happy also, and if we get upset, you'll be upset also. So what we wanted to do here is to test the role of this motivational orientation at the impulsive action, and what is the better platform for us as engineers to test any of these hypotheses it's robots, okay? So we put a controller based on this, on, uh, on for robots, and so put many robots, and then we make them interact each other. And what we observe, we have a test robot, and two, we have one robot which is putting the motivational orientation to this scenario, and the other two robots that are, are following or not depending on what they are observing. And the first thing, and we observe that Motivational orientation modulates behavior. Okay. It depends on the motivational orientation of the environment, of the robots in this case, how, are you, how you are going to behave. And the second thing is that motivational orientation is useful for collaborative tasks. We put an object, a hidden object, and we put all the robots trying to find that object, and we observe as that when they are coupled through this motivational orientation, the, the object is found faster, okay? And also they spend more time around that object. Um, another thing that I want to talk to you is about gate learning for leg robots. This is, real, uh, this is a research spotlight, so I will talk to you about many different things, okay? So gate learning in leg robots. How is the classical manner to teach gates in leg robots? It's to get a cinematic model of the robot, okay? And as soon as you got that cinematic model, you are able to move this robot wherever you want. But it takes a lot of time. Uh, if the robot, this, the one of the legs is not working anymore, your cinematic model is not valid, and you have to create a new, a new one. So what we propose here is what we work here is that we have two leg robots, and the idea is to use new revolution, new evolutive algorithms to learn, to teach the robot how to walk, okay? The robot has no idea how many legs they are. They have no idea which motors connect with this, which, which, le which, which leg. They only know, in the case of Quadratot, which is on the left, it has nine motors, and on the right, it has 12 motors. And it starts to test themselves. And as soon as they reach a goal, which is to, to move from one point to another, they, the network continues this evolution until it reaches the following gates. Okay, this is the final gates we got doing these algorithms. Okay, another other research interest. Um, as I told you before, the retina, what is sent into the optic nerves are spike trains. It's the activity of the retinal ganglion cells. Also, all the visual information we are having is encoded like a kind of binary code moving from the retina to the brain. So the, the thing is that this binary code is not random. It has a lot of structure. If we think that information, we know that information is not encoded in the activity of one single neural, uh, retinal ganglion cells, but it's encoded in the populate, activity of the, popu the entire population, we can do a map between the neural code and language, okay? So, and, and the idea here is to find these structures using NLP algorithms, okay? We have another uh, research topics which are not directly connected with artificial intelligence, but it's also related with neuroscience, and where I think the neuroscience and artificial intelligence are very good marriage, okay, and we should learn about that, is that 
in this case, uh, while we sleep, there are many, our brain becomes in very different stages of sleep. There is one sleep stage that is called N2 and N3, where it's mainly driven by something called slow wave sleep. So they're very slow waves, which are very good for us. We, we, we rest a lot when we have that. Uh, we increase the memory consolidation when we do it. And it's an indicator that your brain is healthy. If you have any neurodegenerative problems, you don't have the delta wave while you sleep anymore, or the power of the delta band starts to decrease. So once in the literature was reported that you can increase the power of the delta wave while you sleep, receiving an auditory feedback. So during sensory stimulation while you're sleeping, you can increase the power of the delta wave. And what he's doing is doing machine learning algorithms to find which is the best pattern to increase higher the delta wave while you're sleeping, okay? Second thing is that the uh, there is an alpha, alpha band. This, um, um, for sleep, we have delta band. For here, we have alpha band. The alpha band is related with concentration. And the idea is here is that you can use a visual stimuli to generate alpha power in your brain activity. And the thing is that depending on how you do it, and when you cut the stimulation, that alpha power can do it, you can make it last for a longer time, okay? Um, another research topic, which is part of the AC3E and the data analytics and artificial intelligence research line is the work done by Ioannis Burkas. He's the MemRistore guys. I don't know if any of you have heard about MemRistores. Some you? There's a few one here about MemRistore. MemRistore was hypothesized about the 50s about the heating electrical device yeah, that was connecting the charge with the magnetic flux. And IBM was able to build the first one no more than 20 years ago, okay? And MemRistores, it's, it's proposed as a perfect model for chemical synapses between models of neurons. Okay, so the thing here is about the MemRistor as a, a MemRistor red neuromorphic architecture. We don't want to use the von Neumann architecture anymore. We want to use neuromorphic architectures. And the MemRistor, it's a key point on that because the MemRistor is a model of, plast of plasticity between neurons. I can do unsupervised learning. I can build an artificial neural network with unsupervised learning where the plasticity is encoded in these MemRistors. MemRistors can also be used as memory collected. We can do an array <coughs> or crossbar nanowires and put the MemRistor in the middle, and this is a non-volatile memory. And the good thing is I can do computations inside this memory. So this memory is not only uh, storaging information, it can only compute about that information. So this is very useful to do simulation like a cellular automata does, but only in one, two milliseconds you get the results. They're very, very efficient, okay? Uh, another research topic is about time wrapping for power consumption traces. So uh, at some point, you, we, have, we, need, we have the need to implement what we know about the artificial intelligence in hardware, okay? Why in hardware in no always using the cloud and all the system we had? For instance, you in the, inside the car, the brake system cannot fail, okay? The brakes, you have to ensure that your brake system must be responding as soon as you need it. So you cannot expect that your operative system is doing a different thing, or you cannot expect that the, their, their, internet, their internet connection will fail. You have to build a hardware and if you want to put intelligence on that, you want to, must be able to build a hardware that will never fail, okay? And, and sometimes you want to know which part of the code your hardware is performing. And you cannot put markers inside because you are slowing down your code, okay? So what we did here, what he's in charge of, Gonzalo Carvajal is in charge of, is measuring the power consumption, consumption of a, uh, of your hardware system, and according to that, try to identify which part of the code is executed, okay? 
And for this, you can take another ideas or another actions according to that. I, I for, okay. And the last one is Jorge Silva, yeah? And Jorge is in charge of, he does mostly inference theory, Bayesian method, detection estimation, and he works a lot about astronomy, okay? So if you want to know more details about what I'm showing you here, please visit the poster number 41, okay? Which is today at the lunch here on the side. And what else? I wanted to mention, two minutes, was it? I wanted to mention that we are organizing this conference for the next year. That's International Conference on Development and Learning and Epigenetic Robotics 2020. It will be on September between the 7th and the 11th on Valparaiso, Chile. We really hope at this period everything is perfect in our country. It will be. Uh, and the reception, on the reception desk, I will leave you some flyers. So if, if you're interested, we have a call for papers for March. Yeah? the 15th of March, so I will leave this information on the reception desk if you want to have more information. And the last thing is that we got the money to buy this robot, if you know, if you know it, it's an ICAP. An ICAP, it's a robot coming from Europe. It's the first time this robot will come to the South Hemisphere. It's like a child of three years old. It has plenty of sensor, and it's an excellent platform to test any algorithms on developmental rendering, artificial intelligence, or teaching. We really hope to have him in the next month. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Okay, that was an impressive amount of amazing research. Okay, thank so, you. Are there any questions for Maria Jose? Hello, thank you for your talk. It was really interesting, and I think it is quite important for us as a community to get ideas from neuroscience. I'm not an expert in neuroscience, but I'm quite curious about your experiments, about modeling dopamine, uh, dopamine systems and evaluating them in robots. Is that part of your research, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I don't do the physiology of the dopamine system, but I have collaborators in the Neuroscience Center in Valparaiso that they do experiments on physiology about that. Okay, we gather the model and we are comparing the model with data from oh. okay. that we have and we put it on robots. Okay, N now my question is how or have you uh, done some research on serotonin? Because as I have heard, uh, they are serotonin and dopamine are uh, re regulate similar systems, and serotonin in humans uh, regulates behavior and social behavior. So, have you got any comment on that? So, the the question is, how do we evaluate these kind of things? If you have, have you uh, done any experiments on this on serotonin? or trying to evaluate theory or models on serotonin No, with I haven't robots. tried anything about serotonin. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. We are a bit behind schedule, so I will yeah. only ask a short question. <laughs> Have you tried this audio signal to, to sleep better yourself? No, yet. No. <laughs> but with the student, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a joke, it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if it works, please share it. <laughs> okay. So now we have uh, our coffee break. Uh, as I said, we're a bit behind schedule, so please don't lag too much at the post. And uh, please be back on time for our next speaker, who is Ian Goodfellow. <laughs>